Myths are not stories that are untrue. Rather, they are tales that don't fit neatly into the historical record, which serve as a foundation to a culture. Rejoice! The vile monster Grendel has been slain. The people are saved. Riders set out in every direction to spread the word that the beast is no more. Citizens and warriors alike celebrate in the streets. And satisfied with a job well done, Beowulf and his men retire to a local inn. For surely they won't be needed at Herat again anytime soon. Right? Thanks so much to Curiosity Stream for helping us tell this classic tale. As King Hrothgar entered his mead hall, he could not help but beam with pride as he saw Grendel's arm hanging from the rafters. So in honor of the great victory, he threw a banquet for Beowulf and his men. Bards sang sagas of past battles, fine food and mead was served, and the Danes presented Beowulf with treasures, from horses to armor to a radiant magical sword. Then, when the celebrations were finished, Beowulf and his band set out again to find other adventures. Then the Danish warriors slept in Herat as they used to, unaware that an even more powerful evil lurked in the darkness outside the hall. For Grendel's mother, a water witch, also lived close to the swamp. And when her son limped back, bloody and wounded, and died in her arms, she wept and then roared with rage. And the night after the banquet, she set upon Herat in a fury, swiftly grabbing the king's most trusted advisor in her knotted claws. This attack wakes up the rest of the men, and they rush to grab their weapons to defend themselves. But it's too late. Grendel's mother is already gone, and she's taken Hrothgar's advisor with her. And so the next morning, to no one's surprise, Hrothgar calls Beowulf back and implores him to find this water witch, and if possible, recover his advisor. But the task seemed impossible, for legend said that the witch lived in a magical lake near Grendel's swamp, where the water burned like acid, and the lake was so deep that no mortal had ever seen the bottom, a place so foul even animals kept away. So how could Beowulf say no to a challenge like that? So the warriors mount their horses and follow the witch's tracks. But along the path, they find a grim warning. The head of Hrothgar's advisor lying on the ground. And just ahead of the, you know, head, was the murky, bubbling, steaming lake. Its surface boiling with serpents, leeches, and demons. But Beowulf is not afraid. He puts on his armor and weapons, takes a deep breath, and jumps right in. It takes almost a day to reach the bottom. Fortunately, ancient heroes had way better lung capacity than we do, and also were apparently immune to mythical acid water. What can I say? He was a magical boy. But the water witch stalked Beowulf in the murky darkness as he descended, and when she found an opening, she struck, grabbing him in a mighty claw and gripping with all of her might, hoping to crush him. But Beowulf's armor held. So unable to kill him that way, she drags him into her cave. And with each step deeper into her noxious lair, sea monsters and demons clawed and snapped. Beowulf then scrabbled for his sword and slashed at the sea witch. But the blade broke, not leaving so much as a scratch, for no weapon forged by human hands could harm her. Okay, uh, not a problem. He'll just fight her with his bare hands, just like he did her son. But, oh, wow. She's both faster and stronger than Grendel. And the water is her element. It quickly became clear, step by step, Blow by blow, Beowulf is losing. He feels himself weaken. His limbs grow tired and heavy. His mighty thews lose their strength. And just when all seems lost, he notices a glint on the wall. A massive sword, so enormous it must have been forged long ago by the giants. So with one last ounce of strength, he kicks his way free of the sea witch and grabs at it desperately before plunging it down with all of his strength into the mother of Grendel. But is it enough? Meanwhile, up on the surface, the Danes see blood rise up from the depths and despair. Their leader is surely dead. The witch has triumphed, and fear begins to sweep over the brave band. What if the witch comes for them next? Some say they should run, while others draw their swords and prepare to meet their fate armed. Then suddenly it happens. Bubbles break the surface of the water. An acrid reek fills the air. This is it. The warriors steady their blades and prepare to meet their grisly fate at the hands of the monstrous Beowulf. Injured, panting, and holding aloft the hilt of a once mighty sword melted by acidic blood and Grendel's mother's head. He was yet again victorious. And as an exhausted Beowulf raises his hand in triumph, a mighty cheer erupts from his men. 
Then with their trophies, they begin their return to Herod. As they near, people race up to the band, cheering and celebrating. And soon, it becomes a procession, a parade of Danes exalting the conquesting heroes and rejoicing in their salvation from the witch. And at its end, they are greeted by Hrothgar, who once more invites them to feast at Herod. Also, he seemed to forget about his advisor real quick, but you know, whatever, it's a happy day. And after an evening of revels, Beowulf and his company bid farewell at first light and head to their ship, elated to return to their homeland. But at the shore, they're met by Hrothgar and his thanes once more, where he again heaps upon them parting gifts, gold, jewels, and a brightly glinting sword, an ancient heirloom, fine in craftsmanship and sharp of edge. And while a lovely gesture, it must have started feeling like when it's your birthday and people only know one thing about you so they keep getting you that gift, you know what I mean? The guy's already got a sword, maybe get him a home mead kit or something, I don't know. Regardless, he thanked the king and the company departed. Beowulf at last will return in glory to the home he has forsaken. But will he find peace? Well, we're gonna find out next time. But you know what we found? A great team up with the folks over at Nebula. And yes, that was the smoothest transition you've ever heard. Thanks to Nebula, we've been able to not only offer a ton of extra credits, extra history, and extra mythology episodes ad-free on their platform, but also create a few Nebula originals as well, such as the Extra Extra History Tipu Sultan Tiger or Tyrant, and my episode of their series Working Titles, where I jam about the opening sequence of Cowboy Bebop and totally don't get emotional at the end. And we love Nebula because they're a by creators for creators streaming service featuring original content from some of our favorite educational entertainers on the internet, such as The Great War, Tirzu, and Jenny Ma. And you know who else loves independent educational creators? Curiosity Stream, of course. So much so that they've teamed up with us over at Nebula to offer a pretty sweet two-for-one deal. Meaning by signing up for Nebula using our link in the description, you'll also get full access to Curiosity Stream, the online learning platform where you can watch thousands of amazing documentaries and award-winning original series. One that we've been really enjoying is Trek Nation by Eugene Roddenberry, where he explores both the mythology and history of his legendary father by attending Star Trek conventions, which is both incredibly poignant and pretty wild if you think about it. So head on over to Curiosity curiositystream.com slash extra credits right now to get both of these amazing resources for only $14.97 for an entire year. Psst, that's 26% off the regular price. Plus, you'll be helping our channel out in the process. Again, thanks for that. A huge thanks to our legendary patrons, O'Reels One, Kyle Murgatroyd, Joseph Blaine, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Alicia Bramble, and Ahmed Ziad Turk.